Sri Lanka is one united nation again and fast on its path to a new future. A future for which a generation of Sri Lankans have paid for dearly, some with the ultimate sacrifice. The Sri Lanka Rupawahini Corporation, being the premier television network in Sri Lanka, consider it our duty to be actively involved in the formulation of that future. Thus, we bring you Checkmate. The stories of some extraordinary people who have gone that extra mile, set out that extra hour to achieve success in very ordinary circumstances. So that you too may be encouraged to aspire for such greatness. Checkmate, a new Sri Lanka, together we can. Hello everyone and welcome to another program of Checkmate. Tonight my guest is someone rather unique, served in the parliament under three different constitutions and his service is probably not going to be matched by anyone at least in our lifetime. He has also been the first parliamentary commissioner of administration or the ombudsman. He is uh, the present chancellor of the Open University and on many an occasion he has been offered several titles and doctorates and whatnot, but he remains and he prefers to remain simply Sam Vijay Singh. Mr. Vijay Singh, I born and welcome to Checkmate. Thank you. Uh, we always start by building the profile of uh, our guest and let me before we start sir say that it's an absolute privilege to have you on our program and an honor. Uh, with the service that you have done to the country, as indeed the region, I don't think we will have enough time to go through it all. But can we start where all stories start, in your youth and your education? Now, I know you were educated for a long time at St. Thomas's, but before that, there's a bit of a story as to why you had to go for a few years to a village school. You want to talk us through that? Well, I am the youngest in the family of six. My three sisters were older. Then the three brothers, all of them out of the house. But when my mother found that I had to go to school, she said, no, the <laughs> house will be empty. <laughs> so I had to go to the village school and walk to the village school because my father didn't want to give me the buggy to go. <laughs> so I walked and I'm glad I was there. I had very good foundation in arithmetic. Yes. And I was there for some time. And then I went to Mathara. Yes. And then finally you ended up uh, at St. Thomas's, St. Thomas's uh, the, yeah. the school by the sea. And, and just uh, a few, I know that it's been quite a while since you were at uh, St. Thomas's yeah. and many years have changed and many things have changed. Yeah. Maybe a few uh, passing fleeting memories you have of, of your school life then. Well, I wasn't a great sportsman because they were all worried about cricket the whole time. I was editor of the magazine yes. and I was in the debating society and took part in games for the house. Mm. And I was the person who had the courage to go and tell what to say them that our magazine has articles in English, Greek, Latin and no Sinhalese or Tamil. So I don't, I said, so shall we start that? Who is going to write them? I said, I will manage that. Well, if you can, go ahead. And it's from <laughs> that time that St. Thomas's Magazine had singles and Tamil articles. Great on you. Then you joined, uh, just, just to get a glimpse of your career until we come to uh, where I went into Parliament. As, as a, You joined the Ceylon Law College and before that the university. You first started reading English, Economics and History. And then you went into uh, Law College after Sir Ivo Jennings had, had uh, amended. I joined the University College. Right. Not the University of Ceylon. Right. In 1941. Right. And at that time, Pekwan was acting principal. Mass had gone. 
and Jennings came and took over and as soon as he could, he converted into the University of Ceylon. <laughs> then the course I was hoping to follow was London History Honours. Right. But he changed the whole thing. It was converted to a history honours with Indian history, Dutch and a number of other things which I was not used to. Mm. So I decided, well, instead of being branded uh, with not too high a class, mm. I will go to the law college. <laughs> and I joined the law college and did my advocate's course. And all my fellows were getting graduated in 1944. Yes. So. Just for the fun of it, I applied to London University and sat for the London BA. Yeah. And in '44, when my colleagues in the university were graduating, I passed the London BA. So just for the just for for, for the sake of those of us who only read about this era in, in books and history. Mm -hmm. Now '44, you speak of going into university college '41, then '44 law college. Now this era about and just before our independence, what was it like? Uh, being a university undergraduate, a youth of the time, what was the... When I went to the university college in 41, there were less than a thousand students. And there were several halls of residence, Catholic hostel, Union hostel, and there was Brody House, which was when the others who didn't go to those went to that. And Brody House, it was in the house called Brody near the present Majestic Theatre. Mm. It was Brody House, so we got that name, not for any other reason. Right. And it became Brody Hall later on, so long as we were in Colombo. Right. But when people went to Candy, yeah. it became other names. Yeah. Now, once again, was there like, was, was the air uh, a buzz with activity of, of, of youth speaking of a new change, of an independent Sri Lanka, uh, a change because youth later on having started under the Solberry Constitution in Parliament, you go on to the first Republican Constitution, you still serve. And then the second Republican Constitution comes, you still serve. I mean, that's a unique uh, I, uh, feat. I don't think anyone in our lifetime certainly will match that. But at this time of just about to gain independence, what was the youth reaction like? What, what, what were you all doing at you the time? Remember, that was the time of the war. 1939, the war started. Yes. You were not affected by it. Uh, till about 1942. And at that time, most of the people were worried about what will happen with the Japanese threatening to come here. And uh, they were taking part in political life. The LSSP was very strong in the university. And they used to dally in that. There were some university people who were participating and when the people like lecturers, Doric Sousa, were members of the LSVC, but he never brought politics into the varsity. Right. In his lectures or anything like that, never referred. And there were others. Mm. And uh, political activity was beginning to f get the momentum. Were you ever a part of that no, activity? I wasn't. You stayed in because, uh, if I had no inclination for those, I was trying to study and get through my exams as quickly as possible. Right. And uh, there I was. Yeah. And now, most of yeah. the people were concentrating on classics and uh, history honors or maths or something. And those are the popular subjects for the civil service. Right. Ultimate objective of most people was to join the civil service. Yes. It was aimed at that. Now, uh, Dina, our usual next uh, couple of segments, we speak of your career and, 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 and the future and what you have to contribute. But before we get there, I know that, uh, although you wouldn't say that we know that you have a very illustrious family of your own now, uh, three PhD holders as children, all doctors, yeah. uh, and, and, and your dear wife who you met at the Royal Tomb. I mean, maybe, a <laughs> maybe a few words on the family. Maybe we can start off on how you met uh, Mrs. Vijay Singh at the Royal Tomb as a young lass from Ladies College. Well, 1941, I was the 10th secretary. Yes. St. Thomas was because the most senior prefect who is not a cricketer is appointed. As a 10th secretary. And we had a habit those days of the 10th committee of St. Thomas was being invited to the royal in the royal tent, and in turn we asked them. Yes. 
So when I went to the royal tent, I saw a young girl in a half sari, cheering lustily for her brother. <laughs> Who was, I think, batting. Tisa <laughs> yes. So I was quite struck by that, but uh, I never will say anything very romantic about first sight <laughs> and that kind of rubbish. So uh, love I at first sight was no, not, no, no, not no, a thing? No, 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 that is so. Oh my God, it's like they lived happily ever after, <laughs> that kind of thing. But then between the two of you, you have uh, produced for Sri Lanka uh, three very illustrious children. One, I think uh, Dr. Rajiv was subwarden also at St. Thomas at one time. He's yeah. presently serving in Parliament. Uh, and Anila, I've had the distinct pleasure of working with. Well, my father went away from school in the seventh standard. And he was very anxious for us to have the education he missed. And took a lot of trouble about us. He had property and by standards of that time, quite well to do. So he was determined to see that we three boys had a good education. Took a lot of trouble over that. And so we were encouraged to study. My eldest brother became a lawyer. Other man, second brother, joined the Navy during the war and retired from the Navy. He died young. And I, originally I had sitting, original ideas of sitting for the civil service, but my wife's father was an old civil servant, and he sort of discouraged people doing the civil, he said it's service not like in our time. And uh, I knew that I wasn't good enough to get into it, yeah. so I didn't aspire for it. In fact, when my university colleagues who graduated with me at the same time, I from London, they from Ceylon were sitting, I also sent my application. And the very first day, there were about 70 candidates assembling in the Skinner's Road School yeah. where the exam was held. Yeah. So we finished the, finish the first day. Second day when we went for the exam, an Englishman in the civil service called McDonald came and sat on the table on the stage and announced, gentlemen, I have bad news for you. This morning's papers are leaked out. Right. And then everybody shouted, quite glad. Yes. He said, yes, don't worry. We'll have about three months more for you to study. You will have another exam. Repeat exam. I came back yes. and I was in my law studies, so I thought this is not going to be easy. I wrote a letter to him asking for a refund of my money. <laughs> yes. 200 rupees was a big thing then. <laughs> we, we, we've heard much about it. <laughs> and I believe it, it is those traditions that you've handed down to your children. Well, we are going to have much more time with this, with this pioneering and illustrious young man of Zen who continues to, to innovate to date and motivate us uh, in several spheres. Uh, we'll be back just after this short break. Hello and welcome back. We are back in the company of uh, one of Sri Lanka's foremost public servants, civil servants. But before we get to a very interesting uh, stage of our discussion, all about his parliamentary career, I uh, just want to remind all of you who have been uh, sending us notes, been keeping in touch with us on email and on Facebook, uh, that, that that is certainly encouraged. You need to be in touch with us, and that is the only way in which Checkmate would be made more productive for all of you. Uh, especially those viewers from overseas who've been communicating with us. I know you have been asking for online links and how you can view this from overseas. Some of you have the facility, some of you don't. Uh, our production team is on that. Do keep in touch with us. You will find the email address and our Facebook page appearing at the bottom of the screen. Uh, do keep interacting. Send us your suggestions, your criticisms, which are most important in order that we may make this program more productive for you because at the end of the day, the idea is that we build a better future and a better Sri Lanka for our future generations. And that is the only medium in which Checkmate can assist you. That is why we bring these personalities who have gone very far in their respective careers so that they can share their experiences with you 
as we try to build a new Sri Lanka. Mr. Vijayasinghe, you served as a Crown Counsel after passing out as a lawyer and entering the bar. And you were with great names like Neville Samarakon, who later became his Lordship, the Chief Justice. What made you decide to quit the bar and, and go into this area of um, parliament and, and work there? When you start at the bar, you find that the income is very low. 1050 was a big fee those days. Yes, one guinea. And I wasn't getting much work except from relations who were proctors, like the Atapattus in Tangalla and my wife's people in Kurnagala. Yes. I, there was an advertisement for Crown Council. A large number of us expected. And there was an interview. Chief Justice Jayatilika's son was one of the applicants. So the rumor went round that he's sure to be selected. In fact, Neville Samarkon told me that Muslims are going. I said, Neville, we applied, we have asked to come, don't that distance, let's go for the interview. And with difficulty, I took him. Mm. And I being uh, with a name with W, I was about the 48th call for the interview. Yes. By which time, Neville had gone and come back. Yes. So Alan Rose was the Attorney General. Mm. Mr. Marshall Pulle was the solicitor. Mm. And there was Harry Vera Surya, mm. great man. Mm. They were on the interview board. Yeah. And as, wo as I walked in, Alan Rose asked, young man, yeah. do you play cricket? Yes. I said, yes. yes. Where do you feel? Yeah. Behind the stumps. <laughs> then he turned to the solicitor general, Steve, do we need a wicket keeper? <laughs> <laughs> because Rose was mad on cricket. Right, right. And a few right. days later, four of us were selected, Neville Samarokon, Vijay Sundar, whose two daughters are both judges, I think, now. Yes. He was a Matsonas man, slightly senior to us. Yes. And myself and Mahindra Raja, son of Mr. Arunandi, who was in the education department. Yes. So we four were taken. And Neving, who had a practice at the bar, even at that time, was put to do civil work. Mm. And we three started mm -hmm. criminal work at the very bottom. Mm. Just to fast track it, uh, to, for us to keep to the time limits imposed on us by the television, uh, when, w what made you quit that and, and enter parliament uh, to, to work in parliament? It was a funny situation. In 1963, Mr. Corbett Jayavadan and Ralph Dirniagala came to my house. Not my house, my wife's house. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, Sam, we have a suggestion. We have tried to find a successor to Ralph Dernagala who is due to retire for next year. Mm. We asked Victor Tenokon. He said he's about to go on the bench. Mm. And he has asked, they wanted any days Vijay Sekar. He was also about to go on the bench. So they came and asked me. I said, I'm a comparatively junior man. Mm. He said, no. Temperamentally, I think you are a man who can get on there. <laughs> So they persuaded me, and I said, I'll come. But I want a permanent sex salary. Yeah. Because by at that time, class two civil servants were secretaries of the state council, like uh, V. Kumar Sami, E. W. Karnangara. And the man at that time was during the Solbury Constitution formation, D. C. R. Gunawadana. Yeah. Ralph was taken as an understudy from the legal secretary's office. Mm. It was a crown council on the sterling scale. Mm. So they said, yes, we'll see that you get a perm six salary. So I went to parliament. <laughs> now, mm. sir, just to set the stage for our, for our viewers, this, now this is uh, probably the, the, the most exciting era in, in the commencement of a truly Sri Lankan parliament. You're talking of the 
Colin Nadi Silva, Dr. late Dr. Colin Nadi Silva, the Bandar Naikas, the DSN Naikas, who came uh, subsequently, and and you know the, the Philip Gunawardeners and everyone whose names we we read with gusto when we read those old parliamentary hansards and what they've done and their speeches and you know Brilliant. into Solbury. And then we, we come to the 1972 First Republican Constitution. But before we come to the 70s, in those 50s, as you, as you entered, as uh, you later became the Parliamentary Commissioner, tell us a little bit about the Parliament then, the people, the, the personalities. There was uh, very good conduct of the members. There was humor and occasional outbursts, but generally they were behaving like gentlemen. Because the camp, people they represented also were very responsible in the country. We got adult franchise in 1931, at a time when our people know what it is. In England, adult franchise of everybody over 21, voting was only in 1928. That is true. Although Parliamentary democracy developed from 1215 with the Magna Carta. Membership was limited to the landed class because land was the source of income. But with the Industrial Revolution, manufacturing people started getting a lot of money and limited liability companies were formed and they began to pay taxes. And the people who were being taxed gradually began to ask for representation. Mm. And little by little, the manufacturing class got elected. But it was only in the 19th century that in England, they had the reforms giving them the voting rights. Mm. Talking a little bit about the personalities in, in Parliament then, uh, we know the names that, that we just mentioned. What was their demeanor like as opposed to, I mean, you, you have, this is the distinct advantage of being around today and having seen what was prevalent then. How would they react to situations? What, what were their demeanor, general demeanor like? Uh, you know, Mr. D.M. Rajapaksa was a member in the State Council from 1936. We knew him very well. And as a schoolboy, I used to go and send a kid to him for a ticket. And I used to get the thing, which he gladly gave. And I used to go and watch proceedings those days. And I saw Sir Baron Jayatilaka, DSN Naika, all those people. H.R. Freeman, old civil servant, who was uncontested for Anuradhapura. And they used to be there. And there's a lot of good feeling in those places. Can I just can I just take you fast track you once again for the purpose of time? In 1972, we hear of um, the, the elected representatives not wishing to congregate in Parliament, but wishing to give the Sri Lankan people their first Republican constitution, and then they go to Navarangahala and they constitute themselves as a constituent assembly, uh, and then I think mainly led by Dr. Colvin at the time, the first Republican constitution is formulated. Talk us through a little bit about that. It wasn't the people's cry. Right. It was a cry of a few people who were interested in it. <laughs> right. You see, in 1956, Mr. Bandaika formed a government which was quite unique. People's government, they said. And Philip de Gunnar joined that. And all his other comrades who were in the leftist parties condemned him. But Philip was a far more foresighted person who realized that the left could never come to power forming a government. So he did the next best thing and he joined Bandar Naik and got through a lot of legislation which he wanted to. Right. People's Bank, Padimra Act, yes. then cooperatives, all that. Yes. So there was actual policy making happening. Oh, yes, yes. See, you know, if you read Philip Gunnar's speeches in Parliament, you realize what a tremendous amount of reading that gentleman had done. Mm. For instance, when they are say flood control relief, 
he withdrew irrigation department papers from 1870 and gave a wonderful analysis of the whole thing in the Ministry for Kalamu. Mm. He never spoke without preparation. Yes. He was fighter. Yes. I, I, I just want, since you mentioned uh, Mr. Philip Gunawardena, I, I want to sort of take your memory to a photograph that we saw appearing in the papers a few years back, uh, which was during an election campaign where uh, Mr. Philip Gunawardena, on one side of the parliament canteen, with a glass cup of plain tea, you can see it's plain tea, a black and white photograph. With, and, and the caption said, with one of his most vociferous critics, Mr. Bandar Naik on the other side of the same table, also sharing that same <laughs> glass cup of plain tea. Uh, I mean, these were two vociferous opponents with each other inside the House of the Parliament. But they obviously were very good friends out there. Yes. You, you want to talk us through a little bit of that, of that ethos of the people of that day? You see, they appeared to quarrel. But after that, they were fine. But, no, one of the biggest opponents of Philip was Ponambalam, when they came to blows. But that was all. I think they don't carry it home. Yes. And uh, uh, they behaved in a much better way. On, on that same tone, sir, I, I just want to post you. I, unfortunately, our time is limited. I wish we had unending time to, to, to speak with you. Maybe we can, my producers will allow me to invite you once again. But uh, during a recent holiday reading, I came across these two quotes, which I earlier told you. One from Plato in, in the Republic, where he says that democracy, in fact, encourages bad leadership because the people's judgment of their leaders is not always good. Uh, and now this, this is Plato, uh, a forefather of, of republicanism and democracy. Uh, very funnily, a stark contrasting politician in Hitler, <laughs> in Mein Kampf, uh, a total different uh, under Nazism, he also comments on the same thing on the psyche of the people. He says, that the psyche of the broad masses is accessible only to what is strong and uncompromising. The masses of the people prefer the ruler to be suppliant and are filled with a stronger sense of mental security. They have very little idea how to make such a choice and thus they are prone to feel they have been abandoned. They don't really know that they have been impudently abused. The, both these people are talking of the people not being perhaps the best choices of their, their representatives. With what you've seen then and what you see now, how do you react to this? Perfectly correct. You see, the voter in the village votes for what he can get. With the MPs promised the roads, the bridges, the schools, the hospitals, they are fine. If we talk of foreign policy and say we won't recognize Israel, Nobody knows where it is. Don't expect them to know anything. Even in America, the people in mid America don't know anything about most other places. They vote as a flock. And the way to get votes is to become popular in various ways. You have to go to the house. That's not enough. You have to sit down. That's not enough. You have to bring the tonic lemonade. However diabetic you are, even the tea you have to drink. Otherwise, get a trava, vadi unene. Vadi una mogu diu vene. So, it's a big thing to go and canvas in our society. Yeah. It's so, not so, you, so you, you, you espouse this notion that not just in Sri Lanka, that, that wherever we say it's the people's power that has actually ushered people, people in. <laughs>